Good morning and welcome to Community Conversations. I'm Vicki Green and I think you're really going to enjoy and learn from my guest in studio today. I know I have and not because I've heard about it from actor Michael J. Fox or Muhammad Ali. Today we're talking about Parkinson's disease with a local person living life every day and trying to improve the quality of his life and work with other patients to help them as well. So joining me today in studio is Tim McMillan. Good morning, Tim. Good morning. You've been living with Parkinson's for five years now? Correct, five years. Okay. And you're an active member of the Massachusetts chapter of the American Parkinson's Disease Association, otherwise known as APDA. APDA. I hope you don't mind if I say that. That's a bit easier. Um, so how old were you when you got diagnosed? 47. 47. Okay. So that's five years ago. We're giving away your age. That's okay. Um, I'll be fair. We're about the same age. <laughs> um, what made you first go to the doctor? What were your symptoms? Because they, they, they say that this is an often misdiagnosed, everybody, all the research says, often misdiagnosed because it may be a mu- muscle tremor and they're told they have arthritis or something of that nature. What made you go? In the first place, it was uh, actually I was out for, actually for my birthday celebration dinner with my wife, and we're at a restaurant, and she, she happened to notice that my right hand was shaking, and I was like, "No, it's not. No, it's not." And I kept argue, arguing with her, like the bed of the doubt, like, "No, no, no." Like, and she said, "It's." I'm like, "Oh yeah, it is." And like, uh, I said, "Oh, I got to follow up with my primary doctor." Go to my primary doctor. He wasn't too sure, but he said it was more like neurological aspect and he sent sent me to a neurologist so he was right away able to say you need a a neurologist yes just from shaking of the hand tremors which by the way for listeners who can't see you you're not shaking at all right now just so people understand so you went to the neurologist correct and i went and saw the neurologist at st v's st vincent's in worcester yep and he did a thorough neurological exam from head to toe uh, from walking up and down the hallway and doing different things and and he confirmed of his conclusion with Parkinson's disease. Now, when you say walking up and down, what are the other things they, that, how do they test for it? Because they're, as far as all the research that I've seen from the NIH, from the Michael J. Fox Foundation, from your organization that you work with in Massachusetts, there's no biomarker testing. There's no blood work that can be done. There's no uh, MRI or brain scan that can tell you you have it. So what kind of test does a doctor have you do? Do there, they, actually, muscle tests? Actually, what he was just doing is just having me see my, how my stride was, and he noticed the, the gait issue, in which people develop gait that have Parkinson's, and there's other things. The, the arm swing, my my right arm wasn't swinging when you walked. When I walked, so that was a biomarker right there, and th- there was other things that he had me to. I can't recall off the top of my head, but uh, when he did his thorough examination, he came back and he says. My con- conclusion comes back that you have Parkinson's. And how did he, t- was your wife, you're married, right? Yes. You no know kids. Was no. Your wife, was she with you when you were diagnosed? Yes. What, how, do, what goes through your head when someone turns to you and says, and there's no x-ray, there's nothing, no paper you can look at that says, here's the, here's what's wrong with you. You have to take this doctor at his word that, and again, it's been widely accepted that it should be a neurologist. If there's any concern from anybody listening, when you go to your primary care, right, it's a neurologist it's, that you want to see. Yes, it's right. a neurologist. Okay. Or, or there's also, to also a, um, what they call an MDS, movement disorder specialist. Movement disorder, okay. Okay. So are they in a neurology, off, are they in the neurology department of a They're hospital? affiliated with, okay. with neurology. Okay. So what went through your mind when they, it's kind of, is it, was it scary? Was it scary? Was it shock? Was it numbing? What went through your head? It, it's just the onset. It's like, why me? How, how did I get this? And just to see what my father went through because he had um, neurological disease that was similar to Parkinson's symptoms. And it was just to see how my dad was. And to see how he ended up. And I just said, I'm not going to end up that way. So what was your dad diagnosed with, not Parkinson's? It wasn't Parkinson's. It was called autonomic systems dysfunction, which is sort of like ALS. ALS. Yeah. yeah. So he slowly, his muscles deteriorated. Yep. He was in Everything started chair. shutting down. He and was, he died rather young. And he was in a hospital bed when, when he passed. And how old? It was 61, 62. Oh, my goodness. And we all think about our own mortality. We're in our early 50s, both of us. And so... That's got to, like you said, it, you, it made you think of your father. But as far as I know, they're saying that genetic testing, there's still, 
there's still no definitive answer, which and there were. That's one of the things that they're working desperately to figure out. They're tr- it, trying to find out because I did go to the Michael J. Fox Foundation um, seminar that was out in Boston a few, couple years back, and the thing they had up on the overhead projector was a, a, a chat. It was like a rainbow chat. Was it genetic or environmental? Genetic or environmental? And don't, and they don't really have any p- positive conclusion to prove which which one it is. But the good thing too, and and Michael J. Fox being um, being a celebrity could have done many things with that. He could have kept quiet about it, which I read from the foundation that he did. He was thirty when he was diagnosed, and that's very young. And we'll talk about some of the stats. But um, he didn't come p- go public with it, according to his own bio on his own website, that uh, for eight years, seven or eight years, uh, because of his career, right? So after the doctor diagnoses you. You you have a comment. What did your wife say? She was at least we have an answer. It, it, that's that's what her thing was. It's not not the unknown anymore. It's like it's like not knowing what's going on physically. So she said, at least we have an answer. So then, what happens as far as treatment goes? The treatment was that they had put me on um, prescription, which was called Acelect, and it, they stat, started me off on the lowest dose, and then I went, he'd come back, go back and see him in six or seven months, whatever it was, and he'd see how I was doing, if there was any progression. And he noticed a little bit more progression, so he upped the medication. So now I'm at the highest level of that medication right now. which And you're on one medication? One medication. Okay. And just, just so that people understand the basic definition of what Parkinson's is, um, because... It, like any disease, it can manifest itself in different ways. Um, I hadn't met you in person before you came in, so I didn't know. But you're totally fine. You could have trouble walking. You could have. I had um, a gentleman with ALS diagnosed two years, and he came in here, no wheelchair, no nothing. I mean, you know, it depends on what stage you're at. So according to the APDA, the American Parkinson's Disease Association, and the NIH, National Institutes of Health, and other sources, Parkinson's occurs, basic explanation, with the loss of nerve cells that normally release the neurotransmitter dopamine in your brain. They slowly die off. So cells or neurons deteriorate. And just to put that in perspective, as far as how many people it affects, someone in this country is diagnosed with Parkinson's every nine minutes. So during our show, our conversation of 30 minutes here, Three people in this country will be diagnosed in the same position as you are. Six new cases per hour, 164 cases per day. And that's nationwide. That's a lot of people. And I've seen numbers with people living with it anywhere between 600,000 to 800,000 and, you know, closing in on a million. But we don't even need those numbers to know what, what a big deal it is. So... The research, like we talked about, clearly says that genetics and environmental, which you said Michael J. Fox talked about, like exposure to pesticides and other things, could cause Parkinson's, but research continues, clinical trials continue. Have you ever thought about participating in a clinical trial? I, I believe I did sign up for some, but oh. I, I haven't really found anything that they sent me information to say oh, they're going to do this because of, I am in the system. Okay, so you're willing to do it, which mm-hmm. some people aren't. Mm-hmm. And I had a guest on a previous show who had can- was living with breast cancer, and she was in a clinical stage two. And just so people understand, there's three stages of clinical trials before FDA will even look at it and approve it. It's a long process. So until you get to the third level, you're still you're really in the testing. I mean, they're really still testing it. And she did it in stage two, in a clinical level uh, t- in a second level clinical trial. So just like you, she was willing to try anything. So that that's wonderful. Are you able to work now? Uh, no, I'm on actually I'm on uh, SSDI. Disability. Disability. Right? Yep. So were you working up until the time you were diagnosed? Yes. Okay. So what kind of prevented you? Did you have flare ups? Just so people listening understand kind of what some of your symptoms were besides like the hand. Did it progress a little bit? Well, I noticed too that I was having more numerous falls. And especially with the line of work I was doing, I was doing a lot of walking. And I was, like, at work one time, and, like, all of a sudden, just out of the blue, it's like somebody pushed me. And, like, somebody was behind me. There was nobody oh, there. Oh, you felt like someone pushed yeah. you? Yeah, and then all of a sudden, I'm on the floor. And that's scary. That's scary. And, and the other thing, too, is Parkinson's can create havoc on vision. 
and I do have depth perception. I was diagnosed. I did have the driver evaluation training up at Phelan Medical. And at Phelan? Yep. yep. And they did a two-hour extensive testing, and they said that, uh, you know what you have to do. And I said, yep, I have to turn my license. because oh, you I, can't drive. I can't drive. And I didn't want to take that responsibility if for some reason I get involved in an accident and I seriously injured somebody or if I kill somebody. I didn't want that, res- that responsibility on me because of my medical condition. Good for you. And that's something I didn't even thought of. I didn't hear the vision piece. Um, I know that I've seen sense of smell. Sense of smell. Gets affected? Could, How does that get affected? Well, it doesn't affect me yet, but they okay. said the taste and smell, but certain people said they, they yeah. were, have strange smells or don't, can't smell at all. Yeah, so it's not just about the shaking and the, and the no, rigidity no, no, and the, um, I mean, and, and the head movement and things, which we saw progress on television with Michael J. Fox. Um, but, but yet he came out and he, and he used his voice to do something about it, and they're continuing to do it with lots of money, which is what you need yep. to, to go through clinical trials. They're very expensive, and everybody wants to find a cure for this. I mean, if you're talking about, and I've read 10 million people worldwide, so this isn't just in America. Though. Oh, no, this is worldwide. Yeah, yep. this is, a, this is a, a, a big trouble. How do you feel about your wife? Because I would imagine, I know that any time, right now you don't, probably, I don't know what she has to do for you physically to live, but as a caregiver of some sort, are you, do you, does she ever express frustration? Are you, are you concerned about well, her? She, she does express frustration in how to come about because she does have her medical issues as well. And it's like, you know, it's like, how do I take care of my husband when I have my medical issues? And it's the same thing with me. How do I take care of my, you know, my wife when I have my medical issues? So how do you do it? Do you have a supportive network of people? Oh, well, we just you know take it one day at a time, you know. Yeah. And then we do have family and you know, that will help out. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what? That which brings me to uh, something that we talked about, and I wish Chad could have been here, but Chad owns DopaFit, which has a, a studio in Western Mass and one in West Boylston, which is in Central Mass, and I'm sure he's looking to spread that. Um, and there's also, uh, it's a boxing studio. And there's also other companies that run them in Northboro, Framingham, Rhode Island. They're, uh, it's called, what is it? Rock? Rock Steady Boxing. Rock Steady Boxing. So Dopa Fit Rock Steady Boxing because they found out that exercise of all things, even with gait issues and walking, exercise, dance, yoga, boxing, it's been evidence-based that boxing helps slow the progression. The progression. So how did you get involved with DopaFit and doing the boxing? Actually, um, Chad came to one of my support group uh, meetings that we had at St. Thee's. For and the APDA? Through the, the APD, chapter, a, yeah. APDA. And he wanted a volunteer to go up and box with him. And I was like kind of, eh, okay, reluctant about doing it. <laughs> and it, you mean you're not an it, actual boxer? <laughs> okay, well, it's like I never did it before. And my wife says, oh, I, I think it would be good for you. And so I said, like, okay, I'll give it a shot. Went up there. What did you do, punch him? And it just went up there. He gave me the glove. He had his mitts there. And we're, and it's like throwing the jabs out and punches. And it's like... With gloves? You yeah, the boxing glove. And uh, he couldn't believe that I was a spot on. And he goes, I, he says, I want you as my first client up in West Boylston when I open up the studio. And you live west of Worcester, so it's not like it's, it's 10 minutes from your house. No, it's a little bit no. longer. So what happens when you go to these classes? Oh, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's the com- camaraderie there that we have with the other people that, that are there. And it's, oh, mainly the age group is probably the same age. We've got two people that are in the 80s that, wow. that box. One's 85. and I That think box? That box. Wow. And there's another one that's 82, I believe. And there's, and there's people in the 70s and late 40s, early 50s. So are there women in the group? There's, there's like three or four women in the group. Because I will say that the data also bears out that typically people are diagnosed age 50 and above. The ten percent below fifty, like Michael J. Fox, or young onset, that it affects men at like one and a half times the rate as, as it affects women. They don't know why. That it affects Caucasian. This is from the NIH CDC research. That it affects um, Caucasian males more so than any other eth- ethnicity. Um, so when I hear there's women in your group, that's really neat. So what are they? It, does it? What do you feel like when you? I mean, I've always wanted to do uh, boxing for exercise because I feel like I'd love to punch something. Well, that's what it is. It's like you, you, <laughs> you, you go there, 
And and I and I, I said I say to myself every Monday and Friday that we go. And it's like we do the Monday and Friday classes. And it's like can't wait for Monday to come because I know I need it. You know, because I can tell like f- from last Friday's session that I could say, oh, it's been a few days. Oh, yeah, start to get the shakes. I got to go. Got to start get my frustrations out and my punches out. And when you go there, it, it's it's being in the room. It's uh, amazing. I mean, just so you can just take out your frustrations on a punching bag and th- throw the punches. And it's, I mean, th- they have nicknames for me. They call me Bam Bam. <laughs> bam Bam. Like the Flintstones, maybe? <laughs> Wait a minute. That's a good thing, right? <laughs> no, but I can just tell, I mean, just seeing your face and your expression, that, that there's something that works for you. It's not medicine, right? But Chad, unfortunately, couldn't be here. He did have a baby. Congratulations to Chad if he's listening um, from last week. Um, but this is just a wonderful thing, and I know he got involved. I read his story because his mother had passed away and was diagnosed and passed away fairly young with them. Parkinson's. So he's a, he calls himself. I think it's a par, he's Parkinson certified physical yes. therapist, right? There is such a thing which I didn't o- occupational know. therapist. Yeah, I, which I didn't know <laughs> that deals specifically with this. And so the ironic thing is, Muhammad Ali, as many know, passed away from Parkinson's, which they often talk about as due to even though I don't think they've technically proved it, due to repeated head injury and things, even though that is a concern. But boxing is one of the wonderful things for people that, that never boxed before that are diagnosed. So how long is the class? How long do you spend in there? Uh, the class is about an hour and a half. Oh, wow. And we do anything from cardio to boxing to footwork. And, and I mean, I, I swear he goes home and dreams up these things when he comes in the next class. Okay, we're going to be doing this. We're going to be doing that. And it's just, I mean, he's a godsend to the so people. He's a very positive guy. Yes, yes. And I mean, he, I mean just... That he's it's thankful that he's out there helping the people in the community with Parkinson's. Yes, and so many other boxing gyms, dance studios, yoga studios. But the boxing is just again, I guess, because of the irony to me with Muhammad Ali that that something great has come of that. I mean, you're not hitting each other in the head, obviously. <laughs> um, but it just have you ever felt like um have you ever missed a punch or missed a target and got gotten well, frustrated well, like my head's not well, connecting well, with my muscles that, that, that's what it is 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 i and uh hand coordination plus the mind is when he gives out these um what do you want to call the exercise no, oh, the, demo uh, the, the the punches like like one two three six three or one two, oh, uh, how many combination times? combination punches and it's like and i all physically did i do that one that I forget, and I I get frustrated with myself, and it's like I, I then I step back and I'm like, well, I'll just redo it again, and he he sees that, but he tells you if you can't do it do it one way, do it another way, like like with jumping jacks, I have sort of problem with my foot, so I can't do jumping jacks the regular way that people should, so he says there's an alternate way to do it, so he's not like at least you're trying it, you know that that's his thing. He says at least you're not just saying oh, I I can't do it, and like I'm not gonna do that. It's do you see people getting fr- other people getting frustrated too? Some people I do, you know. But bottom line is, when you go home, you feel a difference in your muscles, in oh, your yeah. ga- walking, in your gait. Oh yeah. In your, yeah. Do you think that that's a reason? Uh, I don't know if your doctor's mentioned. Did your doctor aware that you're doing? Oh yeah, my neurologist. Neurologist. Yep. And I'm probably fully on board. Right? And, and my primary doctor too. Yep. yep. So are they saying that um, that's maybe why your symptoms are what they are? That maybe it's better? Yeah, he said. You know, they say whatever helps. You know, go for it. And, wow. I, and, and like I said, anything that's good, that's related to Parkinson's, I'm going to take advantage of. Whether, whether it's exercise, informational, you know, that's out there, I'm going to take it. So you go to a support group from the Massachusetts chapter of the American Parkinson's Disease Association in Worcester. But I would imagine that there's chapters, I mean, that there's meetings in other parts oh, of yes. the state, yes. Boston, Framingham, yes. such, yeah. And that you said, you, you mentioned to me that you think there's, they do have, and there's chapters probably in almost every state. I know Rhode, I know Rhode Island does. Rhode Island, okay. I mean, I, that's something that I didn't look into, so, but at, when we give the website at the end of the show, people will be able to go and find, go in and find a local chapter and can go to the national site and look and see if they're listening from northern Rhode Island or southern New Hampshire, northern Connecticut. They can find out. Um... Now, you talked about your dad, um, and being that there's no genetic test, I bet you really wish there was at this point, huh? Mm-hmm. Yep. He, now, he, he was a firefighter, you told me, a volunteer firefighter, yes, and for, so were you. Yes. And um, 
He was a volunteer firefighter for 37 years. Wow. And I was on the same fire department with him out in Spencer. Spencer, Mass., yeah. And right now, um, we tend to believe, but there's, you know, that, that it can be conclusive that firefighters can develop Parkinson's disease. And right now, myself and Greg Heath, who is a retired firefighter from Westfield, that has Parkinson's. He had to retire from the fire service because of mm-hmm. his disease. He actually spearheaded he's trying to get a bill passed in the state of Massachusetts for disability within firefighters. And it's called Firefighters with Parkinson's Disease. Okay. So right now it's a petition, right? You there, is a peti- there is a petition, if you go online, to change.org. And I believe if you go under firefighters or Parkinson's, you'll find the one that says, support uh, mass firefighters with Parkinson's disease. So what is the purpose of the bill? To, to get more insurance? It's to, to get, get insurance more, to cover it? more insurance to cover it and disability-wise and pay for the, the uh, co-pays and the, the, um, I, don't, I believe also for the uh, prescriptions and stuff. How does insurance, um, I didn't even think about this till now, this is kind of off the cuff, but how did you have any issues with insurance? If you're on disability, you're usually on Medicare and Medicaid, which in this state we're lucky to have Mass Health and a Mass Health Connector. Um, have you had any issues with coverage of anything? Do they no. cover the boxing? Yes, they do. They do. Oh, oh uh, that they they get you can get reimbursed. Wow, they get reimbursed for it. That's fantastic. Yeah. So it's really on the firefighter side that there's more of a concern, and we're hearing that actually a lot now, that they're worried about the materials in their suits. And before the show started, you were telling me a story. Why don't you tell that story about you and your dad fighting together? Well, it was back. Uh, back in February 1986, there was a, t- t- a huge tire fire, about 750,000 tires that burnt. In Spencer, in, Sp- in Spencer, uh, up in a junkyard, and we were there five days straight. Five days? Th- inhaling all the toxic and acrid black smoke for so five you days. you weren't wearing straight. masks or anything? It, 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 Oxygen? It, 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 all those guys at that time weren't wearing masks at that oh, time. Wow. And also, I've noticed... I, I told Greg this too, that not only was it myself, and my father, but I have noticed two other guys on my same company that have been di- well, one passed away from Parkinson's, mm. and then from another, the Spencer volunteer. Yes, company. and then there was another one that was my former ca- uh, captain. I saw him at a uh, reunion, and I could tell he, he was trying to hide it. He was putting his hand in his pocket, and then at the end, and I went up to him and I was like, "What's up with the hand shaking?" And he goes, oh, I got Parkinson's. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. He didn't know you had it? Oh, no, no. I said, I told you that before. And he says, oh, I don't remember. And I said, Maybe he didn't want to admit it. Yeah. That, and, that. and so I says, do you think this is all related? So the, he goes, hmm, I don't know. So we hope that people will go online. And if you know a firefighter, I have friends whose husbands are firefighters. And they face a lot of things. And there's a lot of things going on right now as far as chemical and environmental. And they do know uh, that environmental and, as we said, genetics, um, well, they're trying to prove that they play a big part in the diagnosis of Parkinson's um, because of pesticides. And it could be, we don't know, but it could be, as you're saying, being a firefighter, inhaling certain um, chemicals or I know now they're talking about cancer from it, it, the suits. And it's, not, it's like, it's not only, it, you know, like inhale, it's from absorption, it's from inhalation. And the stuff could be in the gear. I mean, back in the time I was on, we didn't have, back then, we didn't have the industrial wash machine just like they do now. Oh, you mean for the uniform? Yeah, to, I didn't to, think to, about clean, to, clean, to, to, uh, to clean the gear. I mean, it, you're lucky if you went and put it in a tub, a uh, sink or something at the, at the station and washed it. But now they have the industrial washer and dryer. So that was in the 80s. That was back in so the 80s. The, the, but, well, which, which, to me, it wasn't that long ago. Because... If you were, I don't know, if you're in your 20s and a firefighter then, you're going to be, you know, 50s now and potentially being diagnosed. But there's been, we have to be clear, there's been no link. Nope. Okay, so this is just, we're, you're, you're trying to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And you want the legislature to get involved. Exactly. Um, you know, some may say, well, it, how can we fund that if there's no way to prove it? You know, and what would you say to people that say that? Well, if we can't prove it, why should we get in, back insurance but, companies? Uh, all, all I can say is that, like I said um, before, and I told people that the firefighters were there for the people in the communities. It's now, it's turn, it's now it's time to turn around and have the community support the firefighters. 
the dealing with Parkinson's on a daily basis. Yeah, and not and it's funny because I not funny, but I hadn't heard anything about the firefighter Parkinson's. I've heard about the cancer firefighter issue, and and the lung, the smoke inhalation, and things like that. But this brings a whole new chapter to what firefighters go through. And first responders, we know they all go through lots of things, whether it's mental, physical, both. You know, I mean, we thank God for first responders of any kind. I must say that. So we can put the DopaFit website um, uh, URL on our web station website so that people can find the class, too, if they're interested. Um, when you go to a support group or talk to other folks, what do you what do they tell you about how they're feeling? Are they are they are you you're ta- you said you're taking it one day at a time. You're not you can't be thinking about, well, are they going to come with up with this miracle drug? But that's got to cross your mind. I mean, it's like, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm on Facebook and I, I see through the Michael J. Fox Foundation about all these things. I mean, it's they have to have the money and have to have the funding. And I know it takes a while for it to get to come to fruition because of all the legalities and stuff they have to go through to get approved. And, I mean, will it be a cure in my, in my lifetime? I mean, I'm hoping there is. Like Michael J. Fox believes they will be in his time. Also, the fact that even if it can't cure, like we when we talked about ALS um, on my last show, the care manager was very um, careful to say that even if, the truth is, even if they find a cure for ALS, it doesn't, won't impact, it can't slow the progression. But maybe with Parkinson's, because it seems like it's, it seems to me, and I'm not a physician, nor are you, but it seems like there's ways, I mean, you can't just be, have ALS and go to a boxing class and strengthen your muscles. That's not how it works. So at least you have things to do, but you have to take advantage of it. Yes, you, you do. Which is what you're doing, right? Absolutely, yep. And that sounds like your message. Mm-hmm. You know, you're very positive. Yes. Right? Yes. And is there any other way to be, I guess? I mean, you know, I, I tell people that, that have Parkinson's, that, that fight it with, along with me, I just tell them, you know, never give up. Always stay strong and keep, keep moving. That's what, they, that's what they say, keep moving. Whether it's boxing, dancing, yoga, whatever. Walking. Walk, walking, yep. Now, you, do you have your own regime at home? Are you on medication? Um, it's, I'm just on one medication right now, um, like at the highest dosage. So if, if something comes up, they'll probably have to add another medication on to that. What I'm but taking. you're willing, and you told me too that oh, you're yes. willing to do clinical yes. trials, yeah, which is important. So hopefully you'll be able to get hooked up with a clinical trial. I'm not sure why people aren't reaching out, but I think that that's probably, you know, it's a tough thing to be in a clinical trial because you never know. But mm-hmm. I've had other patients say to me, well, what do I have to lose? It's often misdiagnosed, which we talked about. A lot of times, I read people will think if you have a mu- if your shoulder or your arm you're shaking, maybe it's arthritis. If you can't move your hand, or and it's it could be an athletic injury. The great news is there's so many organizations in this country and 10 million people worldwide conducting clinical trials on medicines, deep brain stimulation, which is another thing. I don't know if you can explain that a little bit. But have you had that experimented with that at all? No, I've seen people that had it and uh one of the guys that was in the boxing group um he had it done out in boston and he said he'd do it again in a heartbeat so it's deep brain stimulation deep brain it's stimulation. almost like an mri but they attach things to they, your they, head and they, they put stimulate uh, the nerves they put a, like a pacemaker in the chest and they run the wires up oh okay up into the brain where they put the electrodes inside uh-huh. and it's on a battery type of thing that you have to get fine-tuned but he really. said it was helpful the time he did it oh yeah he said he said his wife knows him. He, did, he doesn't shake as much have you thought about doing it uh, i i did and i don't know I, it's like you're a little bit nervous a little, i know i'll say a little bit nervous but i mean and i did talk to chad about it and chad mentioned to me and another woman in the boxing it's like i don't think right now that you you guys would be ideal candidates for because you, you you're not it's worse off as Joe, Joe over here, you know, mm-hmm. that's shaking tremendously, or Jack that was, uh, you know, having problems with walking and shaking. Well, let's hope it stays that way for you. So there are many events coming up this year as we wrap up. The, the Mass Chapter of the Americans Park, American Parkinson's Disease Association sponsors. There's one coming up next month on June 23rd in Framingham. It's the 33rd annual APDA Mass Chapter Optimism Walk 
for Parkinson's. Um, so if people want to volunteer, support, uh, go find a support group or donate, they can go to? They can go to um, AP, apdaparkinsons.org. It's Parkinson with no S on the end. Yep, right? Parkinson.org. Dot org slash Massachusetts. That, that, that's the chapter. All right. Well, a big thank you to Tim McMillan for coming in today and being brave and courageous and optimistic. Because maybe I'm hoping if we reach just one person and say, you know what, if you get diagnosed with something, whatever it is, you can work through it. Absolutely. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, like I said, I struggle, but I, I manage through it. Right. And thanks to people like Chad with DopaFit and boxing, that exactly. that's something that's and, been very helpful. And I like to throw um, a thing to his wife, Saber. Oh, so, sorry, Saba, <laughs> that does the art cut program for Parkinson's yeah. people. And that's something, too. If you want to know about the art, you can go online and find that out, too. So we're going to end with APDA's mission, if you don't mind. The quote is, strength in optimism, hope in progress. That's Community Conversations. I'm Vicki Green. Make it a wonderful day.